are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Happy Blue Friday to all of our listeners. Glad to have you tuning in. And if you're on YouTube checking out our video podcast, yes, we are planning to unleash audio and video podcasts five days a week moving forward. This is the first one. So maybe a few hiccups along the way as we get used to our new software. But for those of you that enjoy watching video casts, you're welcome. Glad to have you on board as we transition into a different set of multimedia with Locked on Seahawks. In case you didn't remember, tomorrow is the second preseason game for the Seahawks, and they will be returning to home at Lumen Field with fans in attendance for the first time in two years. It's going to be a monumental occasion, even being an exhibition game that doesn't count in the standings. I'm going to be breaking down eight players, four on offense, four on defense, that I'm going to be watching most closely heading into this second preseason contest. And of course, sharing some observations from the 16th and final open training camp practice at the VMAC on Thursday. Make sure to check out the Locked On Peacock and Williamson podcast hosted by NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson Monday through Friday. They give you the national perspective all around the NFL, covering all the latest news and insight in every game, team, and move around the NFL. Get your picks and previews and much more every weekday with the Peacock and Williamson podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Now for your lead story here on Locked On Seahawks. Following Friday's walkthrough practice, not much of a surprise, but Pete Carroll was pretty mum on whether or not starters were going to be playing in Saturday's preseason battle against the Denver Broncos. He did say yes, but then just kind of paused for a moment and didn't have anything else to say when he was asked whether or not starters are going to play. Did not provide specifics, said that reporters and fans would see once the game started. So no details in that regard. I would anticipate we are going to see more starters than we did in the preseason opener when Seattle didn't have a single one of their 11 projected offensive starters, including Russell Wilson and DK Metcalf, play a single snap in that game. And most of their defensive starters did not play either. I expect to see a lot more of those players, maybe not for many snaps, maybe a drive or two, but I expect the Seahawks will play more of their starters in this game to tune up for week one against the Indianapolis Colts. While Carroll didn't provide those details on how much starters are going to play, though, he did provide some information on key injuries for the Seahawks. There's some good and there's some bad. Let's start with the positives, and we'll go with the tight end position to start off. Gerald Everett on Thursday, early in practice during warmups was walking with trainers. They were stretching him out on the sidelines, and he did not participate in the rest of practice. There were no, there was no information given by the team whether or not he had an injury there, but he did participate in Friday's walkthrough, so he appears to be fine. We'll see how much he plays because he's considered a starter of the tight end position, but if starters are going to be playing this game, I would expect to see a little bit of Gerald Everett since he practiced on Friday, Jamarco Jones returned to practice this week, participated in three of the four practices coming back from back spasms. He did not play in the preseason opener in Stone Forsythe. The sixth round pick out of Florida started at left tackle. Instead, there's a chance that Jones could be the starter this weekend at the left tackle position, though Forsythe has gotten reps this week with the first team as well. It's possible either one of those players could start at the position. I expect both are going to play in this football game, though. Regardless, they're going to get their share of snaps against Denver. And this might be a good matchup for those tackles because who knows if Von Miller and Bradley Chubb and some of the other talented rushers that the Broncos have are going to play in this game. If they do, that's a nice litmus test in the preseason, at least for a possession or two. And one other injury worth monitoring here, Robert Kimdiche, the defensive tackle, he's practiced this week after missing the preseason opener and about a week and a half of practice with a groin injury. He was a full participant, got a lot of reps during team period this week. Carroll said he wasn't sure if Kimdiche was going to play on Saturday. I would be stunned if he doesn't, though. He needs the reps, needs to show that how well he's played in the practice field translates to game action. And again, he practiced every day this week, so it looks like he's healthy. He looked quick. He looked explosive on the field. So I would anticipate that he is going to be playing some snaps. Geno Smith has made some strides from his concussion as well. Had a couple really good days, but did not practice the past two days. Carroll didn't rule him out 
On the flip side, compared to Kimdiche, I'd be very surprised if he plays in this game since he didn't practice at all and he's less than a week removed from that hard hit that led to his concussion. I think they'll be safe and play Alex Magoo and Sean Mannion as the two quarterbacks. But I guess in the preseason, you can never rule it out, especially if Geno Smith is cleared. As far as the bad injury news, the Seahawks are still waiting to get their starting center back. Ethan Posick has been sidelined for most of training camp with a hamstring injury. He was out the first couple of practices. Then he returned for a couple of days and then re-aggravated the injury, came up lame after a play during 11-on-11, and he's been out ever since. Carroll said he's doing very well, but at the same time, not well enough to return to practice or play on Saturday. It sounds like they're hoping they can get him back on the field in some capacity next week and start to ease him back into things with hopes he'll be available in week one. And you know the player wants to come back because Kyle Fuller has gotten a lot of reps of the first team and some believe he might be the starter in week one, even if Posick returns healthy. So he wants to get back on the field and try to take back his starting job, if that is the case. Receiver Penny Hart received the first legit tag this year for an injury from Pete Carroll, and that is never a good sign. Because when Pete Carroll says that, that usually means it's a pretty significant injury. He called Penny Hart's ankle sprain legit today, said it swelled up on him a little bit. He's been out for two weeks. He won't play in Saturday's preseason game. The positive news, it does sound like he's got a chance to be back next week. They're optimistic that his return is coming soon. So hopefully the Seahawks will get the speedy slot receiver back and he'll be able to contribute again in the preseason finale or at least be ready for week one, assuming that he makes the roster. Two other players that were out on Friday did not practice all week that you won't see on Saturday night. Cornerback DJ Reed is still dealing with a groin injury. No timetable for his return. Pete Carroll didn't talk about him after practice today. He was not asked, so no idea what his prognosis is looking like coming back from that injury. And Marquise Blair has now been out for a week and a half with a bruised kneecap. And so maybe a little bit of concern there considering the injury history for Blair. He's coming off a torn ACL. He has told reporters that's not a big deal. He's feeling fine. But the fact he's been out this long from a bruised kneecap is – not necessarily good news. So hopefully he can get back on the field soon as well. There wasn't an update for him from Pete Carroll today. So the Seahawks have two key pieces of their secondary that will not be available for their second preseason game against the Broncos. As for Kim DJ, Everett, and of course, Jamarco Jones, those three players probably have a pretty good chance of playing in this contest. When I come back in the second quarter, the Seahawks had their final open training camp practice of the season in front of fans. I'm going to break down what I saw and heard from the VMAC observations incoming when we return in the second quarter. Did you know the Built Bar has so many delicious flavors? There is something for everyone. When you talk to a Built Bar fan like myself, we're definitely passionate about our favorite flavors. And if you don't know some of the Built Bar flavors out there, well, you're missing out. Coconut, raspberry, double chocolate, one of my personal favorites, salted caramel, as well as cookies and cream. Tons of delicious flavors. If you haven't tried all the flavors, you can get a mixed box where you'll get two of each of the nine flavors. I usually order two or three sets of them at once because I've got to have a Built Bar before I lift weights or go for a long run. Regardless of my workout, it is my pre-workout snack of choice. Not only are Built Bar flavors the best tasting, but they're healthy too. 70 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from 130 to 180, only 4 to 5 grams of sugar, and only 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. So you get amazing flavors, all tasty, and all healthy. Order today and get the grasshopper cookie or raspberry or whatever you like. Go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order at Built.com. It's that time of year again, and all eyes are now turning to football as teams are back on the gridiron to start the NFL and college football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. Get all the updated odds, props, contests, including online's biggest half million dollar NFL mega contest and the world's largest $200,000 NFL survivor contest open now at Bet Online. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 100% welcome bonus. Be sure to take advantage of their opening day super promo. 
Make a bet on Thursday, September 9th, the season opener between the Buccaneers and the Cowboys. And if you lose, your wager will be refunded up to $25 for new customers only when signing up and using the promo code NFL100. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports from football, basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait. Take advantage of all the great offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Happy Blue Friday to all the 12s out there, and thanks for listening in. The Seahawks hosted their final open training camp practice for fans on Thursday at the VMAC, and I've talked about this throughout training camp. It's really been a sluggish camp overall for Seattle's offense, and I expected there to be a lot of growing pains with a new offensive coordinator in Shane Waldron, but maybe a little more progress over the first couple of weeks than what we've seen. I think that Thursday's practice was one of the better ones overall for Seattle offensively. It was far from perfect, as I'll talk about here in a moment, but there was a lot to be encouraged by. As Russell Wilson mentioned after Wednesday's practice, he felt like there were just a few things that they needed to tune up. And one area that I feel like they've really struggled this month has been in the red zone. In Wednesday's practice, Seattle didn't score a single touchdown inside the 20-yard line. The defense dominated the day down by the goal line. It was a different story on Thursday. Russell Wilson was clicking on all cylinders. He did have to throw a touchdown on fourth down, so the defense at least got him to that point. But Wilson found John Ursua on a quick slant. Ursua might have had the best practice I've seen him have in three years with the Seahawks. He had several catches during their team session, including this touchdown. And then a few plays later with the second unit on the field, Sean Manning was at quarterback and Travis Toivonen, receiver, that came from North Dakota. He's had a surprising training camp, and he gives a little different skill set than a lot of the other receivers on Seattle's depth chart. He's a little bit bigger, a little over six foot, 215 pounds. He high-pointed the football. It was a perfect throw on a fade by Sean Mannion, and Toy Vonan jumped up, high-pointed the football over Demarius Randall, and then got his feet down inbounds for the touchdown. And then during the team session, even when Seattle was inside the 20, they were efficient. Rashad Penny punched it in from a couple yards out on a run play for a touchdown. And two-point conversions. Kate Johnson got one in the flats that they counted. And then there was another one that Rashad Penny ran up the gut untouched for a two-point conversion. So all around the Seahawks, that was the best practice they have had inside the 20-yard line when they were in the red zone, whether passing the ball or running, they were efficient in both facets. And so that's really encouraging going into this preseason game, easily the best they've played in that situational drill. Chris Carson has been in bubble rack has been in bubble wrap for most of training camp, as you would expect, starting running back, entering his fifth season. Teams like the Vikings with Dalvin Cook and the Panthers – with Christian McCaffrey, those guys are not going to be getting a ton of reps during scrimmage in training camp. You want to keep those players fresh. You want to give them just enough action that they're not completely rusty when week one gets here. And typically those type of players are not going to play any downs in preseason games either. I'd be stunned if we ever see Chris Carson get a carry in the three preseason games this year for the Seahawks. But he showed on Thursday that he is still one of the best running backs in the NFL, even if you don't get to see him a lot during these training camp practices. He had two huge runs. The first play in Seattle's scrimmage session, he busted a run up the middle, made a really nice move at the second level to cut away from a linebacker, and there was a ton of green in front of him. If there wasn't a quick whistle, he might have scored a touchdown because it looked like he was running away from a chasing Demarius Randall, but they blew the whistle after about 40 yards. In a game, it might have been six points. And then towards the end of practice, one of the other few carries that he got, this might have been my favorite play of the day because it was a pitch to the outside, and Carson's got Alton Robinson coming after him as well as a corner. Both of them are converging on Carson at the line of scrimmage, and and this is a non-padded practice. So if they just touch Chris Carson, there's going to be a whistle that's blown. Well, Carson didn't let that happen because he made one of the nastiest jump cuts that you will ever see. And he had Alton Robinson just grasping for air, cut outside towards the sideline and bolded about 30 yards before stepping out of bounds near the goal line. It was one of the most impressive training camp runs that I've seen. And it's another reminder that even though Chris Carson is known for trucking people, he can also make people miss in space. He's got some wiggle for a 220-plus pound back, and so he made sure to let everybody know about that in Thursday's practice. 
The one downside for Seattle offensively was they had a lot of pre-snap issues in this practice. They had three consecutive plays with false starts. Will Disley, Brandon Shell, and receiver Freddie Swain all were flagged. And there was another play earlier during the scrimmage where they had an illegal formation penalty. Dwayne Eskridge, the rookie, in just his third practice, there were several times Russell Wilson had to move him around the formation because he wasn't lined up correctly. Those are the types of things that you can expect when you have a new offense. Those are mistakes that happen, even at this stage of training camp. Nonetheless, they have got to get that stuff cleaned up before the regular season gets here. So that was the one red flag in this practice. And otherwise, a pretty good offensive performance. I will say this, the defense did respond. There have been a lot of practices in this training camp where the offense didn't play well early and they weren't able to get things turned around. You can't say that for the defense, in particular the secondary, which went batty during the last part of the team session. There were probably seven or eight pass deflections and an interception to close out practice. And it really started with Jamal Adams in coverage against DK Metcalf. It was a great play. Metcalf ran an in-breaking slant route. The throw from Russell Wilson was a little behind Metcalf. That helped Jamal Adams a little bit, but he was able to avoid the interference penalty, got his left arm in front of the receiver, swatted the pass away, fired up the defense, really the first notable play that Adams made in his three practices since returning with a new contract. And then a couple plays later, rookie Trey Brown out of Oklahoma going up against DK Metcalf, denies a touchdown on a fade route down the sideline. He's got a six-inch discrepancy there. He's six inches shorter than DK Metcalf, and yet he, he stuck with him. He was on his hips, reached his left hand up. The ball was underthrown a little bit by Wilson. If he, if he would have got a little more air, I think it's probably a touchdown. But nonetheless, it was really good defense by Trey Brown, and he continues to be an ascending force in this training camp. Right now, he is making a push trying to get into the lineup with a lot of the other corners on Seattle's roster not doing enough to create separation. He is making up ground. He has a big preseason game. Uh, there's a chance that we could see more first-team reps for him going into that final preseason game. And who knows, maybe the rookie can find his way into the lineup. On the next play, Trey Flowers knocked the pass out of John Ursua's hands. And then to cap things off, Ugo Amadi had already nearly jumped a pass from Russell Wilson moments earlier for a pick six, but he wasn't able to catch the football. Got some redemption this time. Jumps the route, picks Russell Wilson off. That ends up being the last play of the training camp practice. And you know Pete Carroll on turnover Thursday, finishing with a turnover, that is a perfect ending. So the defense, in particular the secondary, they were able to right the ship after a pretty rough start to this practice, especially in the red zone session. And they ended on a strong note with the secondary turning in a bunch of batted balls and, of course, Amadi's interception. And last but not least, we get to see all three of Seattle's draft picks on the field together. They've been out there every practice this week because Dwayne Eskridge was activated from the pup list on Tuesday. But Eskridge has been weaned back into action. Tuesday, he just did some routes on air before practice. Really wasn't involved in team sessions at all. Wednesday, got a few reps, but not a bunch. Thursday, he played a lot more. And he had a 30-yard gain on a bubble screen where you could see that sub 4-4 speed and the explosiveness, the ability to create after the catch. It was a great day with screens in general for the Seahawks, but that was one of the more notable ones with Eskridge flashing his playmaking ability at another big play in the red zone where he caught a slant and turned up field and guys were trying to get to him and you could see the speed again. He was brought down, tapped in a non-padded practice, but brought down inside the 10-yard line and the Seahawks scored a few plays later. So really solid practice for Dwayne Eskridge as he continues to work his way back from a toe injury. DK Metcalf had a 49-yard touchdown on a bubble screen that was set up by an outstanding block by Stone Forsyth, who would have made Dwayne Brown proud if Brown was actually at practice. Forsyth got his hips opened up, and he went out to Trey Flowers on the perimeter and made a really nice block, and that allowed DK Metcalf to rocket down the sideline and score the touchdown. And Trey Brown, as I mentioned, had that fabulous play working against DK Metcalf downfield and getting the pass deflection. So all three draft picks had big plays in this practice the most encouraging thing that Seattle has seen from this 2021 draft class a couple of the undrafted guys had good days as well so that's an outstanding development going into the second preseason game when I come back in the third quarter gonna shift to that preseason game at Lumen Field the Broncos coming to town a talented defense and an offense they're trying to figure out who the quarterback is I'm going to be looking at four players on offense and four players on defense 
that I'm going to have my eyes on closely. Players that I believe this is a big game coming up for them against the Broncos. I'll be right back. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Everyone, this is Corbin Smith from the Locked On Seahawks podcast, here to let you know our episode today is supported by Alaska Airlines. Do you ever get the sudden urge to hop on a plane and head somewhere like Dubai, London, or Tokyo? I've always dreamed of going to London. There are so many attractions to see, including the Buckingham Palace, Big Ben, and St. Paul's Cathedral. The city is also full of historical landmarks such as the British Museum and Churchill's War Room. Being an avid fish and chips lover, I've always been eager to test out the food scene there as well. Now it's easier than ever to get there because Alaska Airlines has joined One World. One World is a global alliance that makes it easy for Alaska Mileage Plan members to earn and redeem miles worldwide. Go global with Alaska Airlines and One World. Learn more at alaskaair.com slash one world. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Blue Friday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. The Seahawks have their second preseason game coming up on Saturday night, and it's the first game they have played at Lumen Field with fans in attendance since the 2019 season. So again, it's going to be a monumental occasion. You know the coaches and players are fired up to finally have fans return. Last year, it was just so awkward. It was something you could not get used to seeing the Seahawks run on the field and then looking in the stands and not seeing a single person there, no crowd noise. You could hear a pin drop in the press box. That will no longer be the case when the Seahawks play on Saturday night, and they're expecting a sellout crowd. The 12s are going to be roaring. Looking at some players to watch on offense and defense in this game, I think the second preseason game has always been the most important one, even when there were four preseason games. I always viewed it as the most important one of the group because you still got to see a decent amount of starters. I don't know if that'll be the case now for the Seahawks, but you always got to see a decent amount of starters while still getting to see plenty of the reserves in late second quarter and the entire second half. I don't know if it's going to play out that way tomorrow night. Again, Pete Carroll seems like he's maybe being a bit more reserved when it comes to playing starters, but we'll see how things play out. It could go either way tomorrow night. On offense, I'm going to start at the center position because I mentioned Ethan Postick at the beginning of the show. He's still dealing with a hamstring injury, and that has really opened the door for Kyle Fuller to become the starting center, at least to open the season. Maybe Postick can win his job back after a few weeks, or maybe he'll get it back because Fuller struggles, because that's really what I've seen so far from him in training camp and in their lone preseason game. It was a rough one for him in Vegas. The play that Geno Smith got concussed on, he was hit by a corner blitz, but even if that corner blitz did not happen, Geno Smith was in trouble because the defender across from Fuller was able to get by him right off the snap, and Smith was staring at that incoming pass rusher. That was part of the reason he had no idea the corner was coming behind him, and that would have been a sack there too. So that was just one play. There were a few others where Kyle Fuller was driven into the backfield. One run play didn't necessarily do anything, wasn't able to create any movement. So I need to see more from this kid. The Seahawks obviously like him. He's been on the roster now. This is his third year that he's been with the organization. And Pete Carroll has talked talked about this being an open competition throughout training camp and even during the offseason. So they wanted to give him this opportunity, and he's gotten a lot of snaps the first team. But I need to see more from him. That's not being overly critical. It's just the reality situation. He really struggled in pass pro the one game that he started last year against the Rams before getting hurt, and he was playing through an injury. I will give him that. He's got toughness, but I need to see more from him in pass protection. I need to see the athleticism he possesses benefit him in the run game. This is a zone-blocking heavy scheme, so you would think that he would be catered well for it, but I need to see it happen on film. This is a big game for him. If he plays well, I think he can solidify that starting center position. If he doesn't, the Seahawks either go back to posing when he's healthy, or maybe they finally look into some other options. They have some internal ones like Phil Haynes and Damian Lewis, or Austin Reed are still a free agent. They've got some extra cap space after Jamal Adams got his extension, so why not go and look at him? So this is going to be a big game for Kyle Fuller. Stone Forsyth is the other line that I'm going to be watching closely. I mentioned it early in the show. Jamarco Jones might be the starter in this game because he's in his fourth year. He's a natural left tackle. He's played both guard spots and right tackle as well, but left tackle was his main position coming into the league. And the Seahawks have always liked him there. Dwayne Brown's obviously not going to give up his starting spot. So Jones has only gotten a few spot starts when Brown was banged up. He's played those couple other positions, but He's had the injury issues this training camp. He was 
out for the last part of the season. Last year, his rookie year, he missed the entire season. So durability has been a problem. I think Jamarco Jones needs a big game because Jake Kieran, the undrafted rookie out of California, I thought held up pretty well last week. And you've got a couple of the other tackles, such as Cedric Abwehi, that are getting close to returning possibly next week. So there's going to be some heat on Jamarco Jones to get the job done, especially considering there's some depth now at guard as well. That versatility brings helps his case, but he needs to get some snaps and he needs to play well at that left tackle position. On the outside, Cody Thompson last year, I think would have made the roster if he did not get hurt. He missed about a week and a half, two weeks in the middle of camp, and that killed him because Penny Hart took advantage of that opportunity. During the time Thompson was out, Hart really came on strong and Ultimately, he was the one that got the last roster spot at receiver. Maybe we could see a reversal of fortune here because Cody Thompson over the last week has gotten a lot of first-team reps, and he's done some good things with it in practice. He had a couple touchdowns this week. He had a reception that was called away or called off in the preseason game last week because of a holding penalty. So he's looked pretty good, and he's a solid special teams player, as Pete Carroll noted after Friday's practice. So it feels like he's going up against Cade Johnson, maybe Aaron Fuller for a sixth receiver spot. If they're only keeping five, he's trying to oust somebody like Penny Hart off the roster. And so it's going to be tough sledding. But again, if he can stay healthy and he can perform well in these preseason games, this is a guy that's now been in their system for three years. The Seahawks are very confident in him. They trust in him. High football IQ, a bigger bodied receiver, can play on the outside and in the slot. This is a great opportunity for him to showcase his talents. If he has a big game, that might be the difference that gets him onto the right side of the bubble in week one and actually make the Seahawks roster instead of being a practice squad player as he's been the last two years. And the last guy on this list is one I'm not sure if he's going to play, but again, he practiced on Friday, so that was encouraging. Thursday did not practice most of the day after he was visited by trainers on the sidelines, but Gerald Everett, I want to see what he brings to this offense. And again, Shane Waldron's not going to show everything that he's got. He's not going to unleash his entire playbook in the preseason. But I would like to see Gerald Everett's athletic ability, the after-the-catch capability, his ability to win downfield, all those strengths that he brings that the Seahawks have just not had at the tight end position in the last couple of years. I want to see what that looks like on the field. And this would be an opportunity against a Broncos defense that I think has got a lot of talent. And I expect they're going to play a fair number of their starters. It'd be a good chance to get a sneak peek of what Everett can do. He's had some really good practices in training camp where we've seen a lot of those physical tools on display. Now you want to see what it looks like in a game situation. So I'm hoping Gerald Everett gets at least a drive or two in this game so the Seahawks fans have an opportunity to see this athletic pass-catching tight end and his first game, have a little bit of an opportunity to make an impact in the passing game. Now, flipping over to the defensive side of the football, I'm going to outline two players that I think are competing potentially for one roster spot. That's Rasheem Green and Robert Kimdiche. Now, Kimdiche, according to Carroll, he didn't know if he was going to play in this game. Again, I would be very surprised if Robert Kimdiche is not dressed for this game. He practiced all week. There were no signs that he was still dealing with an injury. He looked great out there in the field, got a lot of snaps during the team period. So I expect he's going to play against Denver. And Rasheem Green is healthy. He's going to be ready to go. He had a big first preseason game, a sack, three quarterback pressures, blew up a few run plays. So he's going to be looking to carry that momentum into this game. I think LJ Collier's already got a roster spot. Kerry Hyder has a roster spot. But you can only keep so many guys that are hybrid three-tech and five-tech defenders. And it looks to me like this is a situation where Kemdiche and Green are really competing for one spot. Now, what works in Rasheem Green's favor, we got to see him find some success rushing from the Leo position in a two-point stance. And he told me personally that that is not something he liked doing until training camp this year, but he's really worked at it. He's practiced it. And he looked pretty good as a two-point rusher off the edge against the Raiders. And so I want to see him do that a second game while also still factoring as an interior rusher. Because at 280 pounds, you can line him up at three tech. He's got the size to be able to do it. And he plays a physicality most of the time. There's some inconsistency there. But if he can have another really solid performance, it's going to make things tougher on Robert Kimdiche, especially if Kimdiche does not play in this game. Again, I think he suits up. He needs the snaps. He needs to show the Seahawks what he can do in a game situation. But those two are going after it 
for one spot, in my opinion. I don't see both those players making this roster unless somehow the Seahawks view Rasheem Green playing most of his snaps on the outside, and then that would mean another surprise cut is coming at the defensive end position. I guess that's possible, but this really seems like this is a one spot, two players type situation. And so there's a lot on the line for Robert Kimdiche after not playing in the first preseason game. He is far from a guarantee at this point to be in the 53 man roster. He's got to earn that spot by playing well against the Denver Broncos. At linebacker, Daryl Taylor, I thought his first game in more than a year, it'd been almost 20 months since he played in the game. I thought his first game against the Raiders was decent. There were certainly some things where it looked like he had not played in 20 months. He was raw. He really struggled against the run game at times. He's going to have to be tougher at the point of attack, especially when it comes to setting the edge. To me, that was the biggest weakness I saw in his game. That's something that's correctable. Some of that's mindset. And some of it's just the fact he had not played in a game in so long. So I'm expecting him to make quick improvements in that regard. At 255 pounds, he's got enough size to be able to hold up off the edge and be able to contain the run game. So I want to see improvements in that area. As a pass rusher, I loved what I saw from him athleticism-wise. The burst, the ability to pin his ears back and get upfield, all those areas that looked like the player I saw at Tennessee. That's a huge strength for him, and he was flying off the edge. The problem is he was too high. He wasn't getting his shoulder dipped, and that was causing him to drift too far upfield, and so he was overrunning the quarterback. That happened on several occasions. If he can flatten out the top of this pass rush on those speed rushes, turn the corner, get that shoulder lowered, get some ankle flexion, he's shown he can do that in his college days. If he's able to get back to – rushing that way I could see him getting a couple sacks in this game he could have had two or three sacks against the Raiders it just comes down to technique and fundamentals they are easy things to correct and I even saw improvements on the practice field from him this week in that regard so we'll see if it carries over to a game situation but just having another game under his belt is going to be a big deal for Daryl Taylor and I expect him to grow quickly at a position that's really suited for his strengths at strong side linebacker. And in the secondary, I mentioned him during the second quarter, that big play against DK Metcalf. But Trey Brown has been really impressive over the past weekend. When you consider what some of the older corners are doing or not doing for the Seahawks, DJ Reed hasn't been practicing. He's been out for a week and a half. Trey Flowers really struggled in the preseason opener, gave up four receptions in two drives, including a 28-yarder down the sideline where he failed to turn and play the football. That has been an issue for him throughout his NFL career. He has not made the improvements and the adjustments that you would expect from a player that's now been in the league as long as he has and has nearly 40 starts under his belt. He just hasn't made the improvements that you want to see. Pierre Desir was just up and down in his first game. His practices have not been quite as good as they were early in training camp. Akella Witherspoon didn't do much in the preseason opener. He's had some really good practices this week. He still looks like the favorite to start at left corner, but Trey Brown's got a real opportunity here when you consider that Reed's missed a bunch of time. Demarius Randall was out more than a week with a groin injury. Flowers is struggling once again. Witherspoon, who knows we're going to get out of him. He's been great in practice, wasn't great in the preseason game. Trey Brown's gotten a lot more first team run on defense this week. And if he goes out and plays the way that he did the last couple of practices in this preseason game, gets his hand on a football or two, returns a kick and shows some explosiveness, he's in the mix there as well. Don't count the rookie out being able to find his way into the starting lineup. It just doesn't seem like the veterans like Witherspoon and Flowers to this point have done enough to really solidify themselves as starters. They haven't created that separation and Trey Brown's coming. This is a feisty corner that doesn't care that he's 5'10 and has sub 32 inch arms. He's physical. He's going to get in your face. He's going to press. He loves to come up and hit you. He loves to get his hand in the football. Sometimes he's too physical, but Pete Carroll loves that makeup that this kid brings. Even if he doesn't have the size the Seahawks have typically wanted at the cornerback spot on the outside, he checks off every other box. You add in the special teams value. This is a player they're very excited about, and he's going to get tested a little bit. The Broncos have some really good receivers. So if Trey Brown plays some snaps of the first team, he's going to get tested. There's going to be some guys that have great speed that are going to be a problem for him. Maybe we'll see Jerry Judy in this game, former Alabama standout with electric speed, and Trey Brown could end up against him. There are going to be matchups there that are going to be a good evaluation tool for the Seahawks coaching staff. This is a prime opportunity for him to further close the gap, and 
maybe just maybe a rookie can start for the Seahawks in week one at the outside cornerback position. Betting in the NFL doesn't have to be a guessing game if you listen to the new Locked On Bets podcast hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. Get daily picks, blowout specials, wrong team favorite picks, and Lee Sterling's lock of the day. Follow Locked On Bets, brought to you by betonline.ag, wherever you get podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can check out Locked On Seahawks on Spotify. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the all-new Odyssey app. That's A-U-D-A-C-Y. Of course, you can also check out the video form of our podcast on YouTube. Subscribe to Locked on Seahawks. When I return on Monday, I'll be rejoined by my co-host Rob Rang, and we'll share some observations from Saturday's preseason game against the Broncos. Plus, as always, we'll tackle your weekly mailbag questions. Enjoy the game. Thanks for listening in. Go Hawks.